Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, COVID update and general update, October 5th, 2021. First, a big shout out to our patients and thanks for all your support uh, to the practice and to me over the last two years almost for whatever it is, 21 months for COVID. Uh, big shout out to some of our patients who had surgery out of town in Chicago, thinking of you, uh, be safe. Um, and a big shout out to all my staff and people who take such great care of everyone. So let's talk about some COVID things. There's an ongoing debate with vaccination versus infection for immunity. So I just want to review COVID infections versus vaccination. So, but the way to look at it is to look at the vaccine data. And I went over this last spring or excuse me, last winter. If you look at the original formation of how Pfizer was putting together their vaccine. So this is really important so everyone can follow this along. And this is not saying that getting infected is the best way to, to fight off COVID. We don't want people to get COVID. Our preference is people not to get COVID because they can get sick and they can die and have long-term dam damage. So we would much rather in at-risk populations in particular, they get vaccinated. And speaking of that, the Novavax vaccine is getting very close for approval, hopefully, which is the vaccine I've been following the whole time. It is a non-messenger RNA vaccine. It looks awesome. So let's keep our fingers crossed that it will be out soon. So it will be an alternative to the J&J, &J, which is a good vaccine, but definitely has some risks. Um, and so that way, the people who are very concerned about the messenger RNA vaccines will have a very on point, technologically advanced, but non messenger RNA vaccine to potentially use for their protection versus just waiting to get COVID and hoping they don't get very sick. So, but let's talk about immunizations versus infections. The whole basis of vaccine technology is reproducing antibody responses that mirror convalescent plasma levels in recovered patients from diseases. That is how they work. That has always been the goal. Let's look at COVID in particular. What did Pfizer do and biotech or whatever that company's called? What did they do? They took the convalescent, and this is their published reports. And since I read each paper as it came out, and I've reported this before, I'm reporting it again, so you can understand this. As people, as physicians, whoever you may be, the original paper looking at how to pick the vaccine to use was, they looked at about 30 patients convalescent plasma levels two to three weeks after they'd recovered from COVID. They looked at the mean. Pfizer had two vaccine candidates, um, which I've heard talked about before. So they gave five different schemes. They gave one dose of one of the vaccines, two doses of that same vaccine at week dip point one and 21 days. And then the same thing with the other vaccine and they did it with some dosage var variations. What they were looking for and the way they picked the one they were going to use that they submitted for the study and the clinical trial was the vaccine that most closely matched the antibody response to the convalescent plasma antibody levels of the recovered people. And they were looking at the S1 regional binding domain antibody to the spike protein, which is the exact test we use to check antibody levels at our office. That was the test. They tested convalescent plasma. When they found the, the same level in the vaccine that was closest and the, in terms of how they gave it in the dose, that's what they picked. So the first part is and they, per, then they randomized it to 30,000 some people. It was 95% effective with the first rounds of COVID. It, fabulous, awesome vaccine in terms of absolute efficacy. Moderna, very sim similar. But the point being, they proved the success of the vaccine clinically after basing it on 
matching the convalescent plasma of recovered people. If we look historically across the world, there is a scant number of reinfections in prior infected people. To argue that they are not immune or at least as immune and probably much more likely immune than someone who's been vaccinated is, is crazy. They are equal to or more immune because they made antibodies to the entire spike protein segment. As we know with the South African variant, when it was perhaps more virulent, why didn't it reinfect everyone in South Africa? Because the non-neutralizing antibodies, or why didn't it reinfect everybody who'd been infected? The non-neutralizing antibodies people made it in their original infection ended up becoming neutralizing on the variant because even though one part of it got a little more aggressive, the other part changed and their non-neutralizing antibodies covered it. So that is how immunity works. You are going to have better immunity with a real infection virtually every time. When we look at the Israeli data, because they're the only ones giving us any data, the CDC, FDA, and NIH will not do this data. They won't do it. They don't even want to record the number of people infected who've been vaccinated. They don't want to do any comparisons. They don't want to know anything about this because it goes against the nerve. But the Israeli data shows between a 700 and 2700 percent decrease in infection for people who've been prior infected versus vaccinated. Now again, the point is, that's the hard way to get immunity. <laughs> okay, that's the hard way. I would much rather we got immunity through vaccination. But if you've gotten the infection, 95% of the time, because that's the baseline immune rate response, you're going to have immunity subsequently, e either full or partial. So get your antibodies checked. If they're elevated, you're in good shape. That doesn't mean you don't have immunity if they're not, but it's an easy marker because it's all about the bone marrow, which I've talked about. Kim, did I explain that in a way that made sense? I think so. Okay. So again, quickly, the entire basis of the studies for the vaccines, the target point was meeting the antibody level of prior infected people who recovered. Once they found, picked the vaccines that did that, and applied them clinically, there was a 95% absolute vaccine efficacy at prevention or infection of COVID. Clinically and historically, that same prevalence has occurred in the population of infected people, plus or minus a few percent. So we just have to know that, we have to understand it. So don't put, when people put pressure on other people to get vaccinated when they've already had it, that's stupid because you don't know what their risks are for side effects. We have seen lots of side effects in that group. They all get seem to get better from them, or at least ones we're seeing, but there are people who do have uh, severe adverse events from vaccines. So let's be prudent before we judge people. There should be no wringing of the hands if your neighbors have been infected and they haven't gotten vaccinated that they could get you infected. I'd be more worried as a vaccinated person of getting reinfected because, or getting infected because it's a higher rate. Now I'm gonna have a less intense disease than someone who's been unvaccinated and not infected. So again, these are the nuances that the that umbrella groups don't think we're smart enough to handle. So that's why they make it confusing, whereas I think honesty matters. Now. Let's talk about the drug I'm never going to be able to pronounce until Merck gives it a brand name. So, malnupiravir. <laughs> um, they're antiviral. So, in really looking at it over the last couple of days, um, I think the way to look at it is it's a nucleoside inhibitor. It's kind of, you know, structurally in looking at it, it's similar to ivermectin, but actually also fairly different. It's much more analogous to medicine. Some of you may have heard of acyclovir and valcyclovir. Uh, we definitely know the safety profile of those. The other thing is it's really kind of an interesting history uh, with this medicine. It's been around for a while. It never got approved for anything. It got through a phase one trial for flu. In 2020, right when COVID started, Merck did a cell, human tissue cell study, which showed that it killed SARS-2. 
it very effectively in human tissue culture. Uh, they presented it to Richard, to the NIH, and Richard Bright, who was the person that Trump fired, who, who was in charge of the biotechnology and NIH development, who was more than happy to spend all this money on remdesivir and some of these other meds, blocked all research on this because he said that he was concerned about fetal damages in animals. Um, and then, and just to keep in mind historically, he blocked all outpatient oral therapies for COVID or made them essentially so the studies would fail. But so that hung up things um, for almost, you know, nine months or so. And then they finally got their first trial going, their second and their third. And their third trial really looks very, very good uh, in terms of 50% reduction in, in death and hospitalization. Uh, so I'm very excited about it. I presented some of this to my team uh, a day or two ago, two days ago, and that I was excited about this drug because, I mean, it looks really good and safe. And one of them was like, oh my God, that's a big pharma thing. We wouldn't want to use that. It's going to be really expensive when we've been using other things. I said, hold on here. We're missing the point. We've been using things that are FDA allowed, but not well, they're FDA approved drugs and we're allowed to use them as we de deem fit scientifically. But if we actually have a FDA allowed medicine that's also emergency use and there's phase three trials that are double blinded that show great outcomes and it's free because the government already bought it, <laughs> 1.2 billion doses I think um, so far, we would use that because there's a good double blinded randomized controlled trial that's phase three. Now, we will add some things to get excellent results, which would probably be an antibiotics. So 60% who get admitted generally have a secondary bacterial infection and consider steroids. But, you know, the point being, if this drug gets approved, it is going to be a very good choice for all providers to use for outpatient treatment of COVID. And again, our preference is people get vaccinated, but 40% roughly of people getting COVID are vaccinated. We are seeing people get pretty sick who have been vaccinated. We have people getting antibody infusions who've been vaccinated. They're doing well, but, and we haven't had a hospitalization yet, but it's very, very important to recognize that what we used last year, which was hydroxychloroquine and zinc and all the supplement stuff metamorphosized to that plus steroids, antibiotics, and now some combination therein potentially with ivermectin. So again, we're going to adjust as the data adjusts. And so we have some pretty good data points so far with this Merck medication. So I think we need to be optimistic and it could be a game changer as, as the saying goes. Now, in terms of further ivermectin updates, ivermectin, the meta-analysis came out on the 28th, which again seemed to indicate beneficial effects. It referenced the Cochrane Review, and in reading the Cochrane Review, I agree it was not as supportive as that other article made it out, and I apologize for that. I base that on reading another author's opinion. So I agree the Cochrane Review says ivermectin is not harmful, nor is it beneficial, and it needs to be continu continued to be studied. But we may get to a moot point on that if the Merck medicine comes out. So that's the summary of those things. What else am I supposed to discuss tonight? I think I'm missing something. I guess the Edmonds School Board got it pretty hard last night on COVID and their restrictions. Uh, so sorry about that for anyone who was involved and who got upset, but that's how it goes when we're not following science. Anything, Kim? Uh, did you want to talk about the Pfizer guy? Oh, yeah. So one of the things that's pretty interesting, too, is this poor Pfizer scientist. Yeah. <laughs> kind of got snuck interviewed on film about natural immunity versus the Pfizer vaccine. And he did say that natural immunity is better. Now, some people are arguing against it because what, what was the thing that made it, they said that made this not reliable because in order to get COVID, to get the immunity, you could, you had to survive, you had to survive it. That's not the point. The point is people do get COVID. There are people who got COVID before there was the vaccine. And so if they have immunity, why would you give them a vaccine that could harm them? Because that happens with vaccines. I'm sorry, everyone seems to disagree with the concept of uh, vaccines cause harm. 
the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine can cause harm. Tetanus can cause harm. The COVID vaccine can cause harm. It's all risk balancing. So if you're already immune, why would you get it? That's just me. It's like the same thing with the booster. If my antibody levels are 489 consistently from January to now. Why would I get a booster of the exact same thing? Now, the interesting concept though with the boosters too, which I'll finish up with a little bit is, um, you know, if you did get the Pfizer, the trend of the data is the Moderna does give better coverage against Delta. So that's a really interesting concept that if you were gonna get a booster, if you had Pfizer, not that I'm encouraging that, but if you were, the Moderna one seems like it would be a better choice because you'd get some different antigens. And so that would probably be better. So if you are someone who's really interested in getting the booster, you might wanna switch from the Pfizer to the Moderna or the J&J &J to the Moderna. I know that's not the FDA recommendation, but it's the science recommendation. And I think that's what we need to go with. Uh, I had one other thing, but I'm blanking. I can't remember. Anyway, so that's kind of the summary. I think we'll have more Delta still going down. I think um, it will continue that way. We'll see what happens with the other variants. I think we need to be kind to everyone. I think we need to be nice. I, need to, I think you need to not yell at your neighbor if they've been vaccinated or not been vaccinated. People are allowed not to get vaccinated. They're not, this is not a dictatorship or an authoritarian regime. We're a country based on people making their own decisions, whether you like it or not. And I'm telling you right now, mandating things is the road to dystopia you can't you may think you're totally right but then you're going to be you're going to have a different view of something mandating things is not the answer so anyway it's about education and if people don't get educated correctly it's hard for them to make decisions that everyone finds palatable but again people are going to always have difference of opinions so be at peace take care